is there. A little bit more. How's that? Can you hear me at the back and around the other side of the pillars? Where did you go? Well, that makes a difference, doesn't it? Right. Is that better? Yes. yes. Right. Well, once again, welcome to St. John's. And I'm delighted that uh, so many of you are trying to come to all these talks, which have been absolutely um, it's my pleasure today to, to introduce you to Father Paul, who's Abbot of Belmont Abbey. You remember last week we had Brendan Thomas, who is the novice master at Belmont. This is going to be a very different uh, sort of presentation. Um, which we're going to talk on liturgy, liturgy of one monastic prayer. And you will note, I'm sure, that there are some things which will be very much uh, familiar to us in the end. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention. The first thing is that we have been invited to attend a Gregorian chant Vespers at St. Bennett's, which is over the road in St. Giles, on the right-hand side as you're going south. It starts at 6.30. The chapel is quite small, but it's big enough for anyone to go, if you don't mind standing. And um, we're asked to be there if we can at 25 past 6. It would be unfair to the monks to keep uh, popping to the, to the door for us. So if you want to come, uh, please do. You're very welcome, I'm sure. That's one thing. The other thing is that at the end of this series, uh, there's going to be a quiet day, and there are some flyers at the back. That's on the 8th of December in Kidlington. And again, we will be trying to pick up on some of the strands that we've gathered from Benedictine spirituality and just see if we can incorporate them in our own lives without upsetting our whole, whole lifestyle. But uh, I, I'm convinced that we can, so uh, let's do that. Um, on the 22nd, which is the week after next, uh, Michael Woodward is coming. He, is, he was the first elected leader of the Benedictine lay community uh, under, under um, uh, Father, Je Father Jameson's tutelage, I think that was. And um, he is going to be talking about lay monks, you must be joking. Um, but also he's offering to anybody who would like to stay, uh, with a short five, ten minute break maybe after the talk to do a session on Lexio Divina. He's very used to doing this with individual small groups and large groups and it will be a, a wonderful opportunity to really immerse ourselves in that way of praying, very fruitful way of praying. Now, Abbot Paul has been 43 years a monk. <laughs> 20, 20 years in the community in Peru, which he set up, along with us, and um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome him and his dog Toby um, to St. Giles to talk about the liturgy, Benedictine liturgy. I'd like to thank uh, Georgie for her invitation to be here today and also for introducing me. Father Brendan uh, was here last week and as you know he's the novice master in my monastery and he's a very able retreat giver and has incredible expertise at uh, presenting themes and so on. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not in that category at all, so it, it, it would be a very different sort of thing this afternoon. Um, now that you're all familiar with the rule of St. Benedict, this is just one of the thousands of translations, and of course when you look at it, it's a very tiny affair, it's a very small document. And if you scan it and read it and reread it, you won't actually discover a treatise on prayer. Many people are disappointed when they first 
read the rules here, Benedict, if it's not what they expected. And there's nothing much in there about Lexio Divina or contemplative or continuous prayer. But there's an awful lot about praying the office and it's very detailed. If you look at chapters 8 to 20 on the divine office, on the Opus Dei, a lot of detail, uh, most of it you might consider superfluous. And yet, taken as a whole, the rule of St. Benedict is a spiritual document that presents the life itself, monastic life, Christian life, as prayer. Prayer as the search for God, in himself, in others, and in ourselves. And the goal, yes, that perfect love which casts out fear, but the perfect love which enables us to see Christ in all things, in every situation and in all people, especially in the sick, in the poor and underprivileged, in guests, in the young and in the old, and in the, in the adult too. Now Benedict was a very practical and methodical man. There's an awful lot of common sense in the room. The key word is discretion. And he's always looking for what is best for people. That is, for the monks for whom the rule was written. They come first. What are their needs? What would help them? What can be done to enable them to progress on the spiritual journey? So it's people first, not a method, not a system, and certainly not even an organization. The Benedict was a great organizer. In chapter 19 of the rule, he says, we believe that the divine presence is everywhere. But this is especially true when we come together to celebrate divine worship, the divine office. By that he meant not only the liturgy of the hours, but also by extension, all of them because there is a connectedness between every form of prayer uh, in the rule of St. Benedict and in the monastic tradition. And in chapter 20, he talks about praying with the utmost humility and sincere devotion. And really, if we want to pinpoint the spirituality of St. Benedict, the word humility is the key word. And humility is a mature self-awareness which enables us to practice the presence of God, be aware of the presence of God at all times. Prayer then is the fundamental spiritual practice which cultivates mindfulness of the Divine Presence. And I think that's the, again, a, sort of a key phrase, mindfulness of the key presence, of, of, of the Divine Presence. Being in communion with God at all times, being aware of His Presence, being aware that I am in His Presence. <coughs> All prayer 
all monastic prayer, all Benedictine prayer, centers on the Bible, on the biblical word. The Bible was the source and context <coughs> of all early monastic prayer. The monks, our fathers in the desert, the monks of the Pacomian tradition in the first monasteries, those in the Brazilian tradition, in city center monasteries, the hospitals and schools and the rest of it, they read the Bible, they heard it read to them, they memorized, memorized large chunks of it, they used it in their common prayer, and they kept repeating it as they knew it by heart, constantly, whether working, traveling, resting, whatever they did, there was this constant repetition, rumination, remembrance of the Word of God. And if you search the rule of St. Benedict for hints of Benedict's spirituality, you always come back to the Bible, to the Scriptures, to the Word of God. Whether it's common or personal prayer, reading or study, or whether he's just talking about the essential monastic virtues of obedience and humility. Read the rule and if you take away the scripture quotations, there's not a great deal left. But the Bible, the word for Benedict, meant far more than a book and a text. For Benedict, the word is Christ. The word made flesh, the divine, the living word. Speaking through the Bible, and also through other people, those who come to the door for whatever reason, those with whom we have any kind of contact. God is speaking all the time. God in Christ. So you could say that all is Lexio, Lexio Divina. Whether it's the office, whether it's the reading itself, or personal prayer. But more than that, relationships, nature, the whole of life is communication with God. It's reading, as it were, um, hearing the voice of God. And common prayer, prayer together, nurtured and deepened by personal prayer. Personal prayer nurtured and deepened by prayer together. Now we could say a great deal about the divine office in the monastic tradition and of course we can say that in this country, in Britain, uh, the Anglican Church faithfully carried on the Benedictine tradition of the daily offices, albeit um, adjusted um, very sensibly, um, with great discretion in the Book of Common Prayer, with morning and evening prayer matins and evensong. And this great tradition we have in our cathedrals and other churches really comes from the Middle Ages and uh, when so many of our churches and cathedrals were in fact Benedictine and had monastic communities. Many of the uh, great cathedrals, Worcester for example, Ely, and many others, Rochester, um, were cathedral priories. <coughs> there was a bishop, but no abbot. The head of the community was the cathedral prior, 
and the offices were sung day and night by the monastic choir. And it's admirable how this faithfully to the present day, not in the Roman Catholic Church, unfortunately, but um, in the Church of England. But it must be said at the very start that the Divine Office, Lectio Divina, and personal prayer all act and interact together to bring about uh, the goal which is continuous prayer, that uh, constant awareness of the presence of God. In chapter 18 of the rule, um, Benedict gives one of his um, norms when he says, Above all else, we urge that if anyone finds the distribution of psalms unsatisfactory, he should arrange whatever he judges best, provided that the full complement of 150 psalms is by all means carefully maintained every week. For monks who in a week's time say less than the full psalter with the customary canticles betray extreme indolence and lack of devotion in their service. We read after all that our holy fathers, energetic as they were, did all this in a single day. Let us hope that we, lukewarm as we are, can achieve it in a whole week. And so Benedict, um, interestingly enough, uh, you read those chapters on the Divine Office, and if you're old enough, and can remember what the Divine Office was like in Benedictine monasteries before all the changes that came with the Second Vatican Council. Um, although the office was very long, uh, very tedious, and in many monasteries said at breakneck speed, uh, just to get through it, I mean, just the, the burden of it. And I always remember my dear friend, our commander, right Barnabas, May he rest in peace. Always uh, talking about the almost day should never become the almost day. That is, the work of God shouldn't become the burden of God. And certainly, if thinking back to the 50s and early 60s, it had become a great burden. Um, just think of, I think of Belmont when I visited as a boy, as a, as a guest, and going to morning office on a Sunday morning. They began at 4.30 and they had matins, lords and prime. Um, and it took about two and a half hours. And whereas Benedict says that between um, vigils and lords, the monks are allowed out for the necessities of nature. Of course, at Belmont they didn't do that. So by the end of the service, <coughs> Everybody was struggling just to keep going. Anyway, uh, and of course there were all the accretions. I mean, prime, which was introduced in the Egyptian monasteries to stop the monks going back to bed after vigils and laws. You see, they were so tired after being up all night in those offices, which were endless, that the temptation was to go back to bed until terse. And so to stop them going back to bed, the office of prime was invented. That's kind of been abolished now. It's a pity, really, because it was a very nice office. It had a very good set of psalms, and uh, it had a very good hymn. But anyway, they've all been sort of placed elsewhere now. Um, but what Benedict doesn't do when he works out his divine office, he doesn't take the model of the Roman Basilica and the offices sung there by the canons. He doesn't take that at all. And his office, if anything, is rather short. And of course he has to take into consideration summer and winter. Summer with its long days and very short nights. Winter with its long nights and very short days. And so the offices have to fit in somehow, and also we have to remember that there is no electricity or any other form of, um, of light other than oil lamps and candles and so on, 
and um, it's imperative to try and fit in the practical things, like meals, for example, in daylight. So in the afternoon, on a winter afternoon, where vespers and supper have to be finished in daylight, um, the whole day is sort of concertina and, and the night is, is very long indeed. So he adapts the office according to summer and winter and so on. But it's a very short and practical office. And the important thing about Benedict is that it's the first monastic rule to take work seriously. Now he says that they're truly monks who live by the work of their hands. So not only are the offices short, particularly Vespers is, is a short office, um, the day hours are very short indeed, and in fact they, they're repeated almost every day. They can be memorized and they can be prayed anywhere. They can be prayed in the fields or wherever the monks are working. They don't have to return to the oratory, to the church, for the offices in the course of the day. But even so, if you look at his timetable, nothing actually takes place at the right time. Everything is pushed in order to fit in five to seven hours of manual work in the course of the day. And he says, you know, monks are not to complain even if in the heat of summer they're to go out into the fields to bring in the harvest. So work is a very important consideration in the rule of St. Benedict. You fit in your common prayer around the need to work. And then the other services that obviously have to take place in the monastic community, the care of the sick, the preparation and the serving of food, the looking after of guests, all sorts of business that you have to deal with. Anyway, <coughs> um, and, and of course a great deal of that office was said or sung uh, by heart. So Benedict looks very closely at the logistics of a large group of men um, praying together the office of the church. And Benedict didn't want to burden his bones or make life impossible. But there are a few important criteria, no less than 150 sounds in the course of a week. And then he says in chapter 43, let them prefer nothing to the work of God, that is to the common prayer, which parallels what he'd said much earlier in the Tombs of Good Works, chapter 4, let them prefer nothing to the love of Christ. So nothing is to be preferred to the love of Christ, nothing is to be than the work of God. And he tells us in chapter 19 um, how we ought to behave in the presence of God and his angels. Let us sing the Psalms in such a way that our minds are in harmony with our voices. So for Benedict, prayer isn't simply uh, an external, a right, uh, something to be done, something to be got through, a duty. It is actually tuning in to the Word of God, tuning our hearts to the Word of God, and that Word transforming our lives, so that indeed our lives become prayer. And our minds transfigured by the presence of God's saving word. If we look at our monasteries today, well obviously we try to keep the spirit of the rule, but to some extent things have changed. The invention of electric light means that we're not constrained anymore to try and fit things in to daylight. 
So um, in many monasteries, um, we tend to have Vespers much later than in the mood of St. Benedict. And also, as many of our monasteries have moved into the vernacular, pray the office in English, as we do at Belmont, um, it, it, it means that, um, well, how can I put it? In the old days, when it was in Latin, yes, uh, it could be beautiful and it could be prayerful. But for many, it wasn't. Because it was right like reciting a mantra. They didn't really understand what they were saying. Because not all monks are scholars and not all monks know Latin. Likewise, um, monasteries that had lay brothers, the lay brothers couldn't and didn't take part in the divine office. So you had, in fact, in fact, a split community, a two-class community. You could say the rich and the poor, the educated and the uneducated. That wasn't in the mind of Benedict. In the mind of Benedict, every monk can read. And when a novice comes, when, a, when, a, when someone comes to the monastery, uh, part of the novitiate is, in fact, learning to read. And the text they learn to read is the Psalter, the Gospels, and the Scriptures. Perhaps today our offices are far too simple, <coughs> um, too bland. But it's now 50 years since the beginning of Vatican II, and 50 years really since we started changing everything. And if you look around at monasteries today, what you see happening is uh, things kind of going slipping. You, tr you see, we try to be so pure and clean in, our, in, our, in, in working out our divine office. No accretions, they were all sort of done away with. And what you find now is that the office is being enriched. It's, um, it, it, it's having extra things put into it tapped onto it and so on. And the way things are going, quite obviously, in another 50 or 100 years, um, there'll be another sort of purge, as it were, and um, because as the, the more you change things, the more they remain the same. But that's all I really want to say about the Divine Office, uh, because it, there's far more to prayer in the Benedictine tradition than singing Vespers or getting up for vigil. And the other two aspects are, briefly, Lex Divina and uh, contemplative or silent personal prayer. Now, Benedict expected his monks to spend about three and a half hours a day in church um, praying the offices. He also expected them to spend about three hours a day at um, Lexio Divina. Well, what, at what? Um, at the beginning of chapter 48 on uh, the manual work, uh, one of his many proverbs, idleness is the enemy of the soul. So when monks are not working, or not at the offices, or not sleeping, they are to be reading. They are to practice meditatio. What was this for St. Benedict? Well, they're to leave time for reading. And a very favorite a phrase of the um, old monks was <coughs> vacare deo, to be free for God. And in the 13th century English customary, monastic customary, we hear that we read that wonderful phrase, otium sanctum, holy leisure. So the rule talks about meditatio, which really was a slow, prayerful reading of the biblical texts. And it was linked to memorization. Monks committed the Bible to heart for use throughout the day and indeed throughout the night. And we mustn't forget that at that time, monks didn't have their own copy of the Bible. They didn't have their own copy of the Psalter. Um, they were lucky if there, if there were one or two in the library, 
or perhaps chained to um, the lectern in the center of choir. So um, everything had to be memorized. When I was a young monk, I went on retreat for the Diakonocha where St. Benedict was born. And at that time, the Czech monks um, in exile um, were living there. And Father Cyril, Padre Chirino, uh, he had been a novice at M House outside Prague in 19... 41, 40, no, it might have been 39, yes, just before the war. And uh, he was imprisoned first by the Nazis and then by the communists. And he was in solitary confinement for 12 years and, and until he managed to, to escape one day when they were taken for work in, in the forest. And uh, he, he made his way to, to Italy, where his brother lived. And um, Padre Chirino was a wonderful man. But we used to go down to office at five in the morning. And he never opened a book. He knew everything by heart. Every single word, every psalm, every canticle, every hymn, every short reading, every response, every prayer. It was quite incredible. So this, this memorization. Lexi Divina, well, what do we have today? Well, I'm not quite sure. Whatever it is we practice today isn't, I don't think, what was practiced in St. Benedict's monasteries. And um, the, the holy reading has developed and has gone through many, many stages in the 1,600 years or so of Benedictine monastic tradition. Um, nevertheless, um, in Perfecta Caritatis, um, a, 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 the emphasis is on going back to the sources, going back to the origins of monastic life. And so in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there develops this <coughs> method of reading the Bible, which leads to prayer. And it's so dead simple. Um, I was like the easy, and as we are all very different, it is very different. You, you can't teach other, another person to do lexio. You can give them an idea of what it's about. And I would like to think of it as um, reading, which moves into prayer, which moves into contemplation, the presence of God. And it's simply this, it's four stages, four movements of a symphony. Um, the first stage is simply to read the text, short text, a sentence, whatever it is, and discover what it means. But the important thing is, what does this mean in itself? What does this really mean? And that first stage does involve study. It does involve knowledge. And it's so important to do that first stage first. Otherwise, you're imposing on the text your own ideas and your own wants, likes and dislikes. So I think you have to respect the text, first of all. What is this about? And that's why you find in all the early monasteries biblical commentaries. What did St. B. the Venerable do? He wrote commentaries on many books of the Bible. And lots of the early monks did exactly the same. Um, because monks wanted to know what does this really mean? I mean, you can't just pick up the text and hope to understand it better. Than so we all need help. So the first day in Lexio is, what does the text say in itself? And only then can you go on to the second stage, which is, what does the text say to me? Now, many of us, and certainly I have been to um, Bible reading sessions, even Lexio sessions and prayer meetings, all sorts of things, 
where people just jump straight into the second part. I think this, I think this means this, I think that. And it's all I, I, I. But you really have to begin by honoring and respecting the text itself. What does this text say? What does it say in itself? What was Jesus really saying to the disciples, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees? And only then can you move on to the second stage, where if that's what the text is all about, what does it say to me? And only then can you move on to the third stage, well, what is my response? What do I say to this text? What do I say to Christ? What do I say to God? And that leads to what you might say, a holy conversation with the Lord. And ultimately, that leads to silence. The prayer of contemplation, accepting the will of God, internalizing, inwardly digesting, as Cranmer put it, the scriptures. And Lexio has to lead to a transformation, conversion, new life. Uh, and I think the only way you can tell whether you're on the right track is if your charity, your love, your respect, your self-denial, your self-giving uh, grows. I think charity is, is the only kind of proof that anything really prayerful is happening in our lives. But of course I think today that there is a difficulty with Lexington people. Uh, the very decline of the art of reading is, is, is a problem that we're facing. And people are being taught to skim and speed read. Uh, the very notion is antithetical to, to Lexio Divina. And also, again this has happened in the past 50 years I suppose, um, the loss of biblical consciousness, uh, which was so natural to Benedict and to early monks. They lived in a biblical world. The word, the Bible, was their world. And somehow we've lost that. We've lost that. We've lost the, the understanding, the meaning of words, and so on. I'm just going to finish in five minutes. <laughs> um, the Eucharist. Well, what, what, where's the Eucharist in the rule of St. Benedict? Well, there is no explicit reference to the Eucharist in chapters 8 to 20. But then the Eucharist was not a specifically monastic practice. It's what the Church did. And in fact, in none of the early monastic rules uh, is there any mention of the Eucharist. Perhaps no one saw the need to write about it. It was an accepted practice. There was certainly no daily celebration of the Eucharist in Benedict's monastery. And probably the monks received from the reserved sacrament as described in the rule of the Master, which is related to the rule of St. Benedict. And in the rule of the Master, we're told that the monks went to the parish church on Sundays for the Eucharist. But of course, a great deal of evolution has taken place since the days of St. Benedict. And nowadays, the general tendency in all monasteries is to have a daily conventional mass. And indeed, in um, our constitutions, it's described as the apex, you know, the, the summit, the, the, the most important event in the day. But I won't uh, labor that. Personal prayer. Benedict says little about non-liturgical prayer. 
Yet the monks made use of the monastery, the oratory as he calls it, um, for private prayer after the offices and at other times. He does emphasize here the need for silence. That silence is to be kept in the oratory so that those who want to pray personally are not interrupted. Of course, uh, just a brief word about silence. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's quite a big thing in the early monastic rules. But don't forget, you see, Benedict's monks were always together. They slept in a dormitory. They ate in a refectory. Um, they studied in the library or in another common room. They worked together. They, they, they didn't have moments when they were alone. They were always together. And, and therefore the need to have some sort of discipline um, on silence. Nowadays, for a long time now, since about the 16th century, monks have cells or rooms. In some monasteries they have apartments. Anyway, monks have plenty of opportunity to be alone, to enjoy silence and peace. But imagine what it must have been like in Benedict's monastery. Many years ago I gave a retreat at Ross Cray, a Cistercian monastery in Ireland, Ireland. And I was taken by Father Kirone to see the, the former dormitory of the lay brothers. One room, 80 monks slept in that dormitory. They had a bed as narrow as this lectern, a nail on which to hang up a spare habit, and a chair on which they wanted to place anything else. Now just imagine the noise and the smell. Um, it's, it's a completely different vision of monastic life, or we think of monastic life, life as being. You know, we always think of the idyllic peace and the beauty and the rest of it. Um, you know, I think for most monks, most of the time, uh, like married life or any other form of life, um, yes, it has its nice moments, but it can be hell. Um, the description, Father, our dear Father Raymond, um, he was the son of Don Bede Frost, who wrote that very famous book, The Art of Mental Prayer. And Father Raymond, who was prior of Bernard and novice monk, was a wonderful man. And his description of the monastic life was, well, one damn thing after the other. <laughs> and I'm afraid he was right. Anyway, um, what does Benedict say? Simply go in and pray. Not in a loud voice, but with tears and heartfelt devotion. And that's very important. Tears and heartfelt devotion. Now, Benedict was well aware of the earlier monastic tradition brought over to the West by John Cashin, and that was the repetition of biblical phrases or petitions, until they become a sort of a prayerful undercurrent night and day, like the Jesus prayer, or the prayer that was used mostly in, um, in, in Egypt, was the beginning, the first line of Psalm 70, Psalm 69, 70, O oh God, come to my aid, Lord, make haste to help me. And the monks would repeat that um, constantly, no matter what they were doing. And of course, Benedict begins his offices with that prayer. Just to finish then, a final word about tears. Benedict always associates prayer with tears. And this was part and parcel of the Eastern monastic tradition, mediated to the West, of course, by John Cashin. The key word in the East was penthos, that is, repentant sorrow, which was translated into Latin as compunctio, compunction. And it's a sort of parallel, really, with Benedict's humility. And it always had a special link prayer. So, like humility, penthos was to be the mark, both of the novice and the elder. With the growth in humility 
came an ever deeper awareness of one's own sinfulness, as well as compassion and tears for the sins of others. Tears of sorrow mingled with tears of joy, for the repentance both of oneself and of others. And that literature often described as the bread of monastic life. So, compunction denotes sort of the pricking or goading of the heart, and there's a parallel between bleeding and tears. Like the waters of baptism, tears cleanse and heal. They purify the heart, and only the pure in heart can see God. Now, Benedict wasn't recommending some sort of dramatic, unusual behaviour, but rather to pray with awareness, to pray with humility. Purity of heart, tears of compunction, intention of heart, the three go together. So, to conclude, monastic prayer always rooted in the Word. And the Word links, and brings together, <coughs> and unites personal prayer, Lectio Divina, and the liturgy of the hours, the divine office. Right. Now then, questions, um, comments, whatever. Thank you very much. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please do wait until the microphone comes around so everyone can hear what you have to say. Any questions? It was just a bit of that personal prayer. I, I just wondered where it got the place of the cloisters. Oh, the cloisters? Well, they're just a covered passageway. Um, well, no, well, yes, where did it go? Yes. Um, if you just look at the architecture of, of any monastery, or you see them here in the colleges, of course, and the cloisters were basically uh, the way you got from one room to another. And um, most of the rooms didn't lead into each other. So you had to go out into the corridor or out into the cloister in order to get into another room. My mother's Italian from Perugia in central Italy, and I spent all my holidays there when I was a kid, and my grandmother lived in a former Augustinian monastery. Because you know the monasteries were all closed down with the unification of Italy and the rest of it. And, uh, and when I was a kid, I mean, I never thought of becoming a monk then, but it was wonderful because I, and it was a double cloister, you know, top and bottom, and I used to spend hours chasing around the cloister with my bicycle, going in and out of rooms, but the rooms were enormous. And you, you couldn't go from one room to another. You had to go out into the cloister in, in order to get to another room. But essentially, they, uh, the cloister so was just a practical way of getting from one place to another. And in time, of course, they develop, they become more, they become wider, they become uh, um, in, uh, um, well, what, the, what, what do you see today? I mean, think of the cloister at, at, at Gloucester Cathedral in time. And Gloucester Cathedral, of course, wasn't a cathedral in the Middle Ages. It was a Benedictine Abbey, um, St. Peter's Abbey, Gloucester. And so that was built by the Benedictine monks. I mean, it's absolutely magnificent. And then, of course, they started using it. I mean, why have a space like that without doing something useful? So they put the... Um, uh, of course, there were no such things. Well, there wasn't. Benedict didn't allow his monks to have baths because uh, in those in the Roman times, baths were sort of naughty places where, where people went to meet up with loose women and so on. So he didn't want one of those in his monastery. So monks were not allowed to have baths. Um, but of course, they had to wash. And it was done publicly in the cloister because that's where they had the, uh, the sinks and, and what water was available. Uh, because it would come from the fountain or from the well, which would be in the middle of the cross. But there was nothing... Um, 
there's, there's no other signal for this, really. Oh, no. I mean, don't, don't believe anything you see in the movies. <laughs> it's not like that at all. Um, certainly monks um, would have prayed in the church and the oratory. They were accustomed to praying anywhere and everywhere, so they would have prayed at work, they would have prayed on a journey. Um, and they would have prayed silently with tears, of course, on their beds. And from the time that monks had cells, for example, in our tradition, in the English Benedictine tradition, we tend to do our personal prayer lecture in our cells, because it's where you can simply close the door and be at peace and in silence, and no one will disturb you, but not very much. Um, but of course, nowadays, we have things like telephones and computers and so on. So we have to, you have to be particularly vigilant now, otherwise your life could fall apart very easily. Yes? Could you say more about Vatican II's recent subscribing to some of the domestic offices? I can see that some of the early ones, particularly Nineteen Jewels and Prime and one after another, but turn sex and no quite short, and they graduate the day differently, so why would you scrap those? Well, um, first of all, uh, they haven't been scrapped. Um, I think what, what the, um, the general introduction to the Roman office, and indeed to the monastic office, say, <laughs> is that officers should be prayed at the proper time. I mean, in the old days, we used to concertina things. And I can remember at Belmont, you could have um, matins, lords and prime. Then you had two rounds of private masses, followed by the conventional mass. But the conventional mass had tacked on to it, terse, and after it, sexton her. So really, um, you could be in church from 4.30 to 10 o'clock, practically, with just a short break, and trying to fit in breakfast somewhere. And it, 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 it was, and the hours were prayed at the proper time. Um, very often, I remember in Belmont, they always tacked Compline onto, onto, onto Vespers. Uh, so what, what, what Vatican II said was that you really must pray the hours at the proper time. So first must be at the beginning of the morning, sex at midday, noon in the middle of the afternoon, Compline before you go to bed, that sort of thing. Um, so the, certainly the Roman office was greatly simplified. And of course, the Roman office was much longer than the monastic office. If you can, and I don't know if you can remember, but in the Roman office there were five psalms at Vespers. Um, there were more psalms, uh, there were different psalms at various offices. So, so it was a much longer office, than the, the, the Roman office, than even the monastic office. Um, so what, 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 was, what happened was the monasteries were given, were told that um, they did have to pray the hours at the proper time. I mean, I can remember some monasteries in Italy, after lunch, so they could have a good, you know, a long siesta, they'd have Vespers after lunch. So you'd have Vespers at 1.45. But don't forget, before that, I mean, you could have Vespers in the morning. Um, I can remember, and the Orthodox did the same. I think they probably still do. I mustn't say that. Um, but I can remember with Arthur Van Grey Barnabas, he was in Monastery Wales, um, who's a very close friend of ours, and he said, oh, I think we'll have Vespers now before dinner. You see, well, it depends what you call meals. I mean, is, is dinner midday? Is it in the evening? I mean, you can do anything. And there, and there was the tendency to kind of, you know, to fit, fit things in. Uh, and it was unrealistic. 
What I would say now is that you have a far more realistic um, way of doing it. And you don't have to, to, to have all the little hours. Um, you can, in fact, have one larger hour in the middle of the day, which is what we do at Bernard. We have vigils, we have lords, we have conventional mass, but at midday, we have midday office, uh, which actually has got the psalms of terse, sext, and no. And we discovered, we found that, that was, it was better to do that and have everyone come to it. In our case, but in our foundation in Peru, we have all the little hours. It, it's just, it, it really does vary from monastery to monastery. But nothing was really abolished, but you were given the freedom to make, as St. Benedict says in the rule, you know, a, a, an arrangement that would be suitable for that, for that community. We don't pray any less. I do hope that we pray better. And I think that would be my criteria. Um, we tend to pray rather slowly, and we also have silences between the psalms. Um, so we, we try to make the office prayerful. And I prefer that personally than um, getting through a lot of text. Can you say something about something more about tears? I think it's a contra-cultural meeting today. Um, people don't do tears. If they do, they're accused of being depressed. That would be one. And as a kind of addition, what about confession uh, these days? Uh, it seems to me that confession is significantly avoided. When I was a hospital chaplain, uh, the chapel happened to be right next door to the psychiatric unit. Uh, and when I, uh, the Eucharist, which I celebrated there, the, the uh, confession bit was a little bit in the front, and you didn't go on not with a curie or anything like that, in case psychiatric patients got in and were fussed and made great great to do. Those two things. Well, I, 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 as for confession, I, I don't actually think it comes into the theme here, um, but um, all I can say is that in monasteries we are expected to go to confession on a regular basis. Uh, uh, but monks can't go to confession to the abbot, uh, because canon law forbids that. And, um, but the abbot can go to confession to any of the monks. So, but we, 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 I think most people tend to go once a fortnight, something like that. But St. Rose of Lima went seven times a day. But, um, you know, each, of our, each one of us would need to have a private, personal conversation. So, I'm, I'm, Yes, I mean, I do regret the passing of more regular confession. I just hope that the ones that we've made today are somewhat deeper. And it always strikes me that in confession, somehow one wants to get to the root of sin. What is causing that sin? Why, why, why do we do or say or think that way? And what can be done about that? Rather than we tended to do in the old days, of just sort of cleaning the slate and then starting all over again. And, and I think that people have grown up in a way and they realise that was a bit childish and, and a very wrong way to approach confession, which I think why lots of people don't go as regularly as they used to. But as for tears, well, I don't know about how, how to cultural, but I seem to remember when Princess Diana died, um, seeing the whole of Great Britain crying in the streets. And, uh, and in a way, um, I think that the old stiff upper lip is gone. But, well, I don't, I don't see much of it. I certainly see people um, willing to cry at funerals now, or in a way that they didn't. You know, the, the days of Downton Abbey have gone. Um, and we just don't behave like that anymore. So I, I, I don't see tears personally as being counter-cultural, but they're half Italian, so I'm used to crying. 
And uh, I lived in Peru for 20 years, where people cry all the time. And I'm afraid, perhaps, I mean, I can't watch a film without crying. I cry all the time. And uh, I find it quite helpful and really liberating. I wouldn't put anyone off crying. And I never thought of anyone as a to cry. Perhaps I Tears and laughter can be signs of change. Oh yes, yes, and they go together anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, it just remains to me to say thank you very much for coming, and it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourself as well. Oh yes, this is fantastic. I've really enjoyed being here and, um, and being with, with all of you. And I do apologise if anything wasn't clear. And uh, also, if I could possibly say anything, it might have hurt or upset everyone. Sometimes I, 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 my sides aren't quite as prudent and as measured and disciplined as they should be. Thank you very much. And as you go out there, please uh, basket at the back if you'd like to contribute. So the running of this series, um, I've been most grateful. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming.